Hello everyone and welcome to another Tempo Storm Wild Meta video. Patch 1702 was just announced, and this patch contains the biggest wave of balance changes we've seen in several years. Nine cards were nerfed in total, and while most of these changes were targeted towards standard, a couple of these changes were wild format specific, and overall every single one of them will have an impact in Hearthstone's eternal format. So just how will these changes influence the meta? Come join us as we break down the nerfs and how you can expect the wild ladder to evolve in the days to come. Before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Tempo Storm Hearthstone YouTube channel and to turn notifications on to stay up to date with our wild Hearthstone content. First up, let's take a closer look at the biggest of the wild specific changes. Blood Bloom now costs 4 mana, up from 2 mana. Blood Bloom was originally designed to help reduce the cost of Warlock's big removal spells, but as Warlock's range of spells has grown over the years, Blood Bloom's power has grown to enable some powerful combos, such as the combo with Cataclysm, Mechathune, and Emperor Tharzan to win the game in one shot. With the release of Darkest Hour in Rise of Shadows, Blood Bloom has found its most powerful combo yet with Rafam Scheme and Darkest Hour cheating out as much as 40 mana worth of minions as early as turn 4. Increasing Blood Bloom's cost from 2 to 4 is a serious change for Darkest Hour Warlock and Mechathune Warlock that threatens to remove them both from the Wild Ladder entirely. For Darkest Hour Warlock, its greatest strength was its ability to build an overwhelming board in the early turns before the opponent could cope. Now that Blood Bloom costs 2 mana more, the Darkest Hour combo is pushed back 2 full turns to turn 6 at the very earliest. This means opposing aggro decks have more time to deal their damage before a massive board of taunts can lock them out, and control decks have more mana available to use their AoE removal spells even with the looming threat of Nerubian Unraveler. Altogether, the Blood Bloom change makes Darkest Hour Warlock much more fair, and without the chance of an early cheese kill, Darkest Hour will probably drop out of viability at the higher levels of the ladder. The Blood Bloom nerf is a big deal for Mechathune Warlock as well, since the traditional combo is no longer possible with just a single Emperor Tharzan trigger. This means the combo will need to change significantly, and the new combo will most likely involve Dollmaster Dorian and Emperor Tharzan together. Here's how the new combo works. With an empty deck, Mechathune in hand, and an Emperor discount on your combo pieces, play Dollmaster, then play Plot Twist to summon a 1-1 Mechathune, then play Cataclysm to eliminate the hand, board, and deck, and win the game. This combo is similar to the old one in execution, but since there's an extra combo piece, it makes the deck a little more unreliable in the early game, since you're more likely to draw a combo piece when you can't use it against aggro, and more likely to fall to disruption effects like Dirty Rat against Control. Overall, while the Blood Bloom nerf doesn't completely cripple the Mechathune combo, it does make the deck a little less consistent choice for ladder. The Blood Bloom nerf is a huge blow for Warlock, and while Darkest Hour Warlock might be out of commission, it's not the only high tier archetype that the community wanted to see cut down to size. Quest mages have held the top tiers hostage ever since the snip snap nerf, and now with the nerf to open the waygate, we may finally be free from quest mages grip. Open the waygate now requires 8 spells from outside of your deck to complete the quest, rather than 6, which means that the quest takes more time and resources to complete. Will it be enough to kick quest mage out of the top tiers? Let's take a look. Tempo Quest Mage thrives on generating extra spells very quickly, often completing the quest on or before turn 5, usually after a massive swing turn with Flame Waker and Sorcerer's Apprentice. Changing the quest completion from 6 spells to 8 might slow down the deck's KO finisher turn with Time Warp into Giants by a turn or two, but it does nothing to affect the swing turn play patterns with Flame Waker, not to mention the deck's stellar early game turns with Licensed Adventurer and Questing Explorer. In other words, the deck's early game will not change, but will have more trouble transitioning into its late game. This is a big deal against aggro decks, since it's harder to take control of the game by using the quest to reverse the board, but against slower decks, you still have plenty of time to complete the quest and assemble the kill. This means that quest mage's matchup spread will become even more polarized, which might not make the deck unplayable, but it might be enough to kick it out of the top tiers. What about Reno Quest Mage? Compared to Tempo Quest Mage, Reno Quest Mage is better equipped to play longer games against aggro, thanks to the deck's defensive suite and Highlander package. However, since the Highlander deck has fewer cards to complete the quest in general, it may have issues closing out the game against other late game decks and combo decks after the nerf. Will this be enough to knock Reno Mage out of tier 1? It's possible, but Mage's Highlander suite is among the most powerful in the game, so the deck will be far from unviable. Altogether, the nerf to open the waygate was a more subtle nerf, and only time will tell if it's enough to release the iron grip that Quest Mage has on the meta. The remaining nerfs in this patch are all aimed 
assumed mostly at standard, but they will have implications on the wild meta. First among them is Kael'thas Sunstrider, whose claim to fame in wild is enabling degenerate combos in Druid, such as using Innervates and biology projects to fuel zero mana ultimate infestations. Kael'thas's mana cost is increasing from 6 to 7 mana, which will slow down any critical mass push with him by at least a turn, but will that be enough to discourage him from seeing play? Probably not. With the best mana acceleration in the game, and Barnes now becoming more and more popular, it's usually not an issue for Druid to get Kael'thas up and running ahead of schedule. That's not to say that the nerf is completely ineffective. 7 mana Kael'thas does give opposing aggro decks more time to try to cut through Druid's defenses, and it also gives Druid less mana to work with during the combo, making it more likely for the Druid to run out of gas. Even with that being true, this Kael'thas nerf is definitely low impact, and it's not the change the community wanted to see. Many players wanted to see Kael's ability itself changed, such as a change that only allows the third spell to be free instead of every third spell. As it stands now, you can still expect to see decks like Jade Druid dominating the ladder until more is done to bring Kael'thas to heal. Bad Luck Albatross is next up on the nerf list, and while it might be a weaker card than Kael'thas, its nerf is certainly going to have a greater impact. As a 3 mana 4 3, Bad Luck Albatross had a competitive stat line for its cost to go with its disruptive death rattle effect, but after the nerf, the Albatross will be a 4 mana 4 3, which is a much less impressive stat line. The stat to cost ratio may be worse, but the real issue is that at 4 mana, Albatross no longer works with Baku the Moon Eater, so decks like Odd Rogue and Odd Demon Hunter lose one of their most effective aggressive tools against Reno decks. Beyond Baku, Albatross has also seen play in Cube Warlock, but that's likely to change since Albatross competes with Voidcaller in the 4 cost spot on Curve. Altogether, a more expensive Albatross affects multiple decks, and with fewer birds out in the wild, you can expect Highlander decks like Reno Priest to reap the benefits. Next up is Frenzied Felwing, and as a 3-3 minion that can be played for free, it has become a solid choice for face decks in wild, even if it's nowhere near as popular as it is in standard. The nerf to Felwing brings its stats down to a 3-2 instead of a 3-3, without changing its cost or effect, which means it will still come down just as quickly, but it will be much easier to deal with by trading with weaker minions like South Sea Deckhand, or with removal effects like Defile or Arcane Flak Mage. For decks that live and die by flooding the board like Aggro Druid and Even Hunter, Frenzied Felwing probably still makes the cut, but don't expect the Felwing to be much of a mover and shaker anytime soon. The last of the non-Demon Hunter nerfs is Sacrificial Pact, which now only affects friendly demons. Wild players are no strangers to seeing Sac Pact used in decks like Cube Warlock to combo with Voidcaller and cheat out big demons, and the inability to target enemy minions does not change that combo in the slightest. This nerf does make the card less useful against the occasional Demon Hunter or Cube Warlock mirror match, but the real impact of the Sac Pact change is the removal of Sac Pact from the Zephyrus pool. Now that Zephyrus can't find a zero mana answer to demons, Reno decks lose one of their biggest answers to big warlocks like Mogianus. Outside of Zephyrus, you can expect to see warlocks play Sac Pact about the same amount as before, thanks to the Void Caller combo, so it's not going anywhere anytime soon. Last, but certainly not least, are the Demon Hunter changes, which are all having an impact on the class's premier wild archetype, Odd Demon Hunter. Altruist the Outcast now costs 4 mana instead of 3, which strips the Baku fueled deck of its best AoE board control option. Battlefiend has its attack reduced from 2 to 1, which makes it a weaker turn 1 option and reduces the deck's early game damage output against slower decks. Finally, Glaivebound Adept has its attack reduced from 7 to 6, and while it's still a solid stat line for a minion with such a powerful battle cry, it makes it harder for the adept to contest 7 health minions like Squall Hunter and Kael'thas. Factor in the loss of Bad Luck Albatross, and all these changes together put Odd Demon Hunter's place in the format at risk. While we still expect the class to be relevant, Demon Hunters will need to make some adjustments to stay competitive. Altogether, this is one of the biggest nerf waves in Hearthstone's history, and Wild is certainly not immune to the changes, so here's where we expect to see things shake out. The Bloodbloom nerf will push Darkest Hour Warlock out of the meta, and force Mechathun Warlock to adapt or die. Open the Waygate is slightly weaker, but we don't expect quest mages to go away anytime soon, and the same is true of Kael'thas and Jade Druid as well. Bad Luck Albatross's mana cost change is a huge blow to Baku decks, and a huge boost for Reno. Frenzied Felwing and Sacrificial Pact will still see play in the decks that played them despite their nerfs, and Odd Demon Hunter 
Carter will need a facelift if it wants to keep up after all of its nerfs. With the loss of Darkest Hour Warlocks as well as weaker quest mages and fewer albatrosses, the big winners of this round of nerfs are likely to be late game control and combo decks, such as Reno Priest and, ironically, Jade Druid. That being said, Wild is a wide open format, so the full impact of these changes is still up in the air. Let us know in the comments where you think the format will go from here, and as always, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to stay up to date with our Wild Hearthstone content. Thanks for watching.